Hello, thank you very much. Thanks for the warm introduction. So tonight we'll talk about uh, executable sizes. We will see different techniques, how we can, uh, we can shrink uh, the executable, uh, the size of the executable. So from time to time, you might see that uh, I'm looking at my phone with, and you will be correct, I'll do that. It's because uh, that's where I have uh, access right now to, to the chat. So feel free to, to ask any time. I will try to keep uh, an eye on it and, uh, and answer the questions if, uh, if you have any. So, well, Lucas, you already in introduced me so we can uh, jump over this quite quickly. My name is Shandor Dargo and I'm working as a senior engineer for Spotify uh, since, uh, since last year. And uh, I write uh, uh, quite a lot for, uh, for my blog. It's mostly about uh, C++, but, uh, but not only. Please uh, check out if you're interested in, uh, in interesting books uh, as well. So before we move to the agenda, let me share uh, a bit my motivations, why I, uh, why I wanted to, to make this talk. So we were discussing with Lucas before uh, this event. And uh, I told him that, uh, well, usually when I propose a topic, you know, it's, it's always like a month or half a year before uh, actually a presentation would happen. So usually I do that because I don't know anything about the topic and uh, I want to make a commitment so that I will learn about it. And uh, I wanted to understand C++ binaries, the executable is better because that's something I didn't really uh, know about, I didn't really care about. So at my previous job, that was not really a concern. We were concerned about not having uh, too many versions uh, of the same libraries on the same servers because it took uh, too much space, but uh, we didn't really care about like the size of each version. It didn't matter that much. And uh, in fact, runtime performance was also not something that was really interesting because when you work, uh, well, you already use C++, so it's it's faster than almost, uh, almost anything else. But uh, when you have to deal with uh, database calls and uh, network connections, uh, usually like uh, that's, that's not the first thing you think about, like, okay, how can I uh, really optimize this, uh, this small algorithm here? You go to a C++ conference and for sure there will be a five minute lightning talk about uh, how, you can, uh, how you can optimize, uh, I don't know, printing some, uh, some numbers. And usually they are fascinating are really interesting and they uh, show that uh, the, the the presenters know really the last uh, bits and bits of, uh, of C++, but uh, at work, at least uh, in the domains where I work, that was not really necessary. But uh, right now, uh, it matters a lot. When I uh, joined Spotify, I realized that uh, now I'm working in a domain where uh, uh, executable size is uh, is really important. So I uh, wanted to you know to, to speed up also my integration and uh, to be a more useful colleague. So I wanted to recognize these patterns that uh, they lead to to bloat. And uh, I also wanted to understand the effects of modern uh, modern coding practices because uh, I remember an old discussion with a with the director who complained about like uh, whenever we move to you know newer uh, platforms, newer architectures, when we move to from assembly to C, from C to C plus plus, whatever the the executable size is just just bloated. And uh, well, I said okay, uh, these are all interesting uh, points and. Uh, and, uh, well, I just want to understand uh, better these things. So hence uh, this talk today, and maybe this is not going to be the, the last one because for sure we can, uh, we can go farther uh, in, uh, in this topic. So let me share what uh, I'm going to talk about uh, tonight. We're going to see 
uh, how object initialization uh, affects uh, binary size. We'll see what we can do uh, with special functions. Uh, we'll see if virtual functions are so uh, bad for our binary sizes or, or not. Uh, we'll talk a bit about uh, RTTI, exceptions as well. And uh, well, we'll see one design pattern and uh, we'll see if, uh, if different implementations uh, have an effect on, uh, on the binary size. And uh, as a result of it, we'll talk a bit about how to, how we should uh, pass functions around. I was thinking about originally to talk more about like how an executable uh, uh, is, is, is built up, what are the different uh, parts, what are the different sections, uh, but uh, but I decided not to because I don't want to to make this uh, this talk too long. I try to finish uh, everything in an hour, and then we still have time to to discuss. I'm also interested in uh, in your experience, uh, how you uh, make your binary smaller if if that's a concern at uh, at your job. So with that, let's uh, let's move forward. So what I want to, to share before uh, we move forward is that, well, not everything is, uh, is a best practice that helps you reducing the size of your binary. We'll see things that uh, otherwise, like I, I wouldn't really recommend doing, but uh, it, it's useful maybe to, to know about it. And in certain circumstances, you might want to to, to employ those uh, those techniques, but these techniques are sometimes just uh, just simple trade-offs. You give up a bit of uh, readability, uh, even some runtime performance sometimes, just to gain uh, some uh, some bytes. And uh, it it might be a valid trade-off if runtime speed is not so important for you, uh, but uh, you do care about the binary size, then uh, maybe you want to consider them. So you might ask the question, why would it be so important to gain a few bytes or a few kilobytes or a few kilobytes, sometimes even megabytes here and there. Uh, I, I, I cannot really share any numbers, but uh, there is a clear correlation between the, the size of an application and the number of people who keep your application, who decide even to, to install. But also, if uh, you do an update and uh, you roll out some new features, but uh, it makes your, uh, your app much bigger, well, people might uh, just, uh, just uh, remove your app. And uh, even, even where... Uh, where, uh, uh, sorry, where uh, like uh, the the speed of the connection is not so important, but definitely in markets where uh, that's a that's a huge concern because uh, you don't have four uh, G or five G almost everywhere. So let's uh, start about something uh, very basic. I'm not sure it's uh, this will be the most interesting part, but. Uh, Let's start with the basics. So object initialization and binary sizes. And we'll start with, with a big binary. So you see, we have a simple node here with two integers. Uh, both are initialized to, to one. And we have uh, this to the array of this node. And uh, it has 10,000 uh, items. And this, uh, this code generated uh, almost uh, 100 kilobyte binary, this very simple, uh, small piece of code. Uh, which I would say it's relatively big, uh, but what contributes to this uh, huge size? So I started uh, with, with a small example and I started to, to change uh, very small uh, things and I kept uh, compiling and uh, I was checking uh, the, the results and I found that, okay, there were three components. One is the container, 
The second one is the, the storage duration of, uh, of the array that uh, you create. And the third one were the initial values in, uh, in, uh, in the node uh, class. Probably that's the most uh, interesting part here. But uh, well, again, I told in the beginning that not uh, everything that I say is a, is a best practice that uh, you should use, but uh, it's worth thinking about it. So when uh, you change an array to something else, which uses uh, dynamic allocations, that will keep your binary a bit smaller. Now, of course, it slows down uh, the, the executable. So for example, with the uh, list and, uh, and vector that uh, will uh, allocate uh, on, the, on the heap, unless uh, we, we have something uh, really small, you might have uh, a smaller binary. And C style containers and studio array might help making, uh, making your binary a bit, uh, a bit bigger. Well, uh, you see some uh, some numbers here. So, what uh, probably I could have uh, normalized the compile time and runtime numbers, but uh, what you can see here is uh, basically that uh, well, if you use a studio array or C style array, uh, you will, in this case you'd have like uh, two three times uh, bigger uh, binary for the small uh, piece of code even though the runtime was uh, much uh, faster for them, obviously because the initialization happened at, uh, at compile time and not, uh, not at uh, runtime. So I thought that the other, the sec second aspect was like storage duration. And uh, when you have uh, global static variables, they, they have a static uh, storage duration. And uh, often the compiler could uh, uh, like uh, do all the necessary things at compile time to to create and store these uh, these containers, and they uh, might end up uh, the whole container with all the items in the text or the data segments. It also depended a bit on uh, on constants and uh, what uh, kind of initialization uh, I used, but uh, my goal was not to go into the very details on that. Now, if you use some uh, some local storage duration, automatic storage duration, you have used some local containers, uh, well, they won't uh, make your uh, binaries huge because uh, things uh, will uh, will happen at runtime, even even if you manage to make them const, but uh, if they are const exp and uh, they can be initialized at compile time, they might uh, take up a lot of space. So here again, just uh, sharing some numbers where I uh, where you can see two numbers in the in the same uh, field. It means that one was compiled with O3, the smaller one. The bigger one is uh, is O0. So. You see that uh, if something uh, is global, in this case, just like we saw the difference for uh, for vectors and then the arrays, the, the difference is like uh, three times. And uh, in this case, you can see pretty much the same, uh, uh, same uh, ample of difference in terms of uh, runtime too. So the, here, the bigger your uh, your binary, the, the faster it is, because uh, well, you don't have to, to create uh, the the objects at runtime. Now, what I found interesting is that uh, the initial values might matter. If we change the values in the previous example from zero, uh, sorry, from one to zero. So we do this change, and uh, this means basically that an integer a and integer b won't have like uh, a random numeric value, but they will have uh, uh, the value that we could consider default for uh, for an integer. Then 
the binary will shrink from uh, 99k to, to 16k right away. And uh, the reason behind this is because the, the compiler can, uh, can optimize the initialization. Now this also might, uh, uh, for sure it depends uh, on the compiler, which compiler you use, which version you use. I've been using Epoclang uh, for, uh, for my experiments, but I'll share a couple of uh, examples later where uh, I have access to, to, to numbers from uh, three different uh, uh, compilers three different, uh, on three different platforms. So when we change the initial value from one to zero, uh, the SMB also changes. And uh, well, the, what you see in the executable, it changes a lot. So before, when we have uh, the one as a default, uh, when we have uh, one as a, as a value, you see all these lines, long one, long one. Well, basically we, we assign, the compiler assigns this uh, one value. And you will see it like uh, 10,000 times. Now, if it's the default zero, then uh, it can take care of it only with uh, this one zero field comment. And you see that uh, we have that number there, uh, 80,000. And the 80,000 comes, uh, so let's let's move back. It, it, it comes from this node. You see that we initialize 10,000 and uh, we have two integers. So basically we have uh, two times four bytes in this node. The size of one is uh, is eight bytes. And that you take uh, 10,000 times and uh, there you have it. You, you zero fill in uh, the data segment for 80,000 bytes. So think twice about what the uh, default value you use. Sorry, let me check the, the chat. Okay. So let's talk a bit about special functions and uh, binary sizes. And the first question you might ask, okay, should I use a default for my uh, uh, special functions or, or not use default? That's, that's the question. And uh, well, uh, based on uh, best practices not related to binary size, but also related to binary size, follow the rule of zero. Don't specify anything if you don't have to. But uh, otherwise, go with, uh, with the rule of five. That's the best practice part. Uh, and use the default whenever it's possible. You will see that uh, there are different reasons for, uh, for that. But the question is, where should we use the default? Should we use it in the header or should we use it in the CPP file? Well, when I first started to use uh, default, it, it made sense right away to use it at uh, declaration time because well, it's readable for, uh, for us, you open a, class uh, declaration, you see, hmm, okay, we have these special functions, but they don't do anything uh, interesting. Uh, let's just uh, let's just move on. And it turns out that it's also helpful for the compiler if it sees this default at the uh, time of the first uh, declaration, because uh, then it knows that uh, nothing uh, nothing uh, special will uh, will come after. So it's good for us. It's good for the compiler. The compiler can perform certain uh, optimizations, uh, might perform certain optimizations. Why would, why would you do something else? Now you might come up with, uh, with some ideas because uh, you know we try to, usually we try to hide like implementation details 
And I remember I uh, asked this question once that hmm, if we try always to like uh, hide implementation details in, uh, in the CPP, why not to default there? Because, uh, well, with that you don't expose that it doesn't do anything special, but uh, I was told that, well, readability and uh, and also like uh, the the help it gives to the compiler is way uh, way more important. And uh, in fact, you shared that now uh, you have nothing really to to hide. That's, that's what you share. But there is another aspect too. And uh, when I uh, joined the the project that I I work on, I started to see. Uh, defaults like out of line in in the cpp file that was like oh why is that i don't like that uh let's uh, let's move it uh let's move it to the header so i i didn't say that uh, i uh, sat down and uh, i started to move it everywhere but if i was uh like uh, touching a file then uh, said, okay, let's uh, let's also do this update. Let's uh, leave this uh, place cleaner that uh, that I found. And then once I was like, okay, please don't do this. We do it uh, for for a reason, because if you default in the CPP, then the compiler cannot uh, cannot inline the the body of this uh, defaulted uh, function. And uh, with that, well, if it's not inlined, okay. Uh, there will be uh, um, the the uh, the the code uh, will be called like uh, as, as a function, so it won't be repeated over and over again in uh, in uh, in a binary. And uh, it turns out that on a big project scale, if you move uh, the defaults out of the header file, it can uh, it can uh, shrink the executable uh i would say in a it's 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 significant now here i cannot uh, share uh, exact numbers simply because i don't have them but uh if uh, you for example compile check the size then do some uh, some uh, similar changes and uh, you recompile and you compare the size you will see the difference, and the difference will always go in one direction. Your executable will uh, will shrink on a, on a big project scale if uh, if you do this out of line. So there comes the question: like, where should you default? Well, let's say sorry for this pun, but by default you should default in the header, and. Uh, you should consider doing it in the CPP if you really want to gain some space. Again, it will depend uh, on your use case. For us, this is important. For you, it might not be, but uh, this is one way. But I would say this, is, uh, this seems counterintuitive and uh, it can be even misleading. In a, in a certain way, both for the reader and the compiler, because as a reader, you think when you look at the header, oh, okay, so there must be something uh, interesting going on. Let's uh, go to the CPP and check. Well, there's nothing interesting there. But I would say if you want to use this technique, then you should document why you do that uh, somewhere. Maybe just uh, add a comment there in the CPP why you do that, or uh, do it on a project level. Because otherwise, there will be a newcomer, and uh, someone will start uh, undoing it just because it goes against so much against uh, what uh, normally we we learn about this. And now let's uh, move over to to virtuals and. And binary sizes. Well, probably I don't. Uh, I shouldn't uh, talk too much about uh, what uh, does the virtual keyword do for us. So let's uh, move uh, over this quite quickly. But uh, well, it enables us to to redefine methods in in derived classes, and 
basically it differs function binding from compile time to, to runtime. So for example, if we have this car class uh, and uh, then we derive from car and we implement the city car, an off-roader, and uh, just to, for, for the sake of the example, we have an SUV inheriting from city car and not from the off-roader. I didn't want to have a diamond problem here. Then uh, let's have a look what is really going on. How does this look like? So let's say we have a container of car pointers. Well, if you look at the uh, right side, you'll see that, uh, well, for each class, we have a V table, a so-called virtual table. And uh, in that, we'll see these, uh, well, basically, there will be some function pointers. And uh, it will help uh, the runtime to find out which function, which uh, override it should call for, uh, for these, uh, these functions. So, uh, so each object has the, the V pointer, the virtual pointer. It will point to the right V table and uh, then at runtime we can bind to, to the correct function. So for example, in city car, we see that everything is from city car for offloader, everything is from offloader. But for the SUV, well, for the sake of the example, the accelerate is uh, overridden in SUV, just like the brake. But the shift is uh, is not. It's inherited from the city car. So in this V table, everything is uh, is uh, is properly de defined. Every every information is there, so that we can call the right override. My hypothesis was that uh, a V table should significantly increase the size uh, of a binary, but then each additional virtual function shouldn't really add uh, a lot, only a little bit. And uh, I ran some experiments. So I created this, uh, this small class and uh, you see that uh, the destructor and uh, all these getters, uh, well, they have virtual in uh, uh, as a comment by uh, that I meant that uh, let's turn them on one by one and see how the binary size uh, changes. And uh, I ran some experiments uh, with, uh, with an array of 10,000. And you see that uh, when you move from a non-polymorphic class to, to a class which has already a virtual destructor, so it's considered polymorphic, the binary is really bloated. Like uh, instead of 16K, we moved up to 281. But then, as so I added virtual function, another virtual function, uh, the size always grew only by uh, 48 bytes, exactly 48 bytes which seems that on uh, the implementation I used, it seems to be the size of one row in uh, the corresponding uh, virtual table. So hypothesis validated in that sense that uh, indeed uh, one virtual, the first virtual matters a lot and uh, each additional one doesn't really matter in, in a sense of uh, binary size. But uh, I said that, well, that difference was quite huge. So let's use some other initial values. Let's avoid uh, that kind of optimization. What happens then? So I changed the zeros to, to ones because we saw earlier that uh, that kind of change help, uh, can, have, can, can really have a big effect on, uh, on the binary size. And indeed, uh, before we had, uh, what, what was the size? It was 16K, I think, uh, for the non-polymorphic version. Now we went up to 150, almost 150, but the, the size of all the others didn't change at all. And uh, what happens if we 
use an array of, of, of one. Well, probably I should have just removed the, the array. We, but I decrease the size of the array significantly. And uh, now the change uh, obviously decreased, decreased uh, a lot, but it's still significant. So what to say in a, in a, in a book, I don't want to, 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 to share its uh, title in this context, but uh, in a code example, it said that, well, let's just uh, make the, the destructor virtual. And uh, it says something like, in any case, that's a useful thing to do. Well, no, 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 no. That's, uh, that's clearly not uh, something, uh, something useful. It has, uh, it has its uh, implications on, uh, on the binary size. And the right after that I read that I said, whoa, come on, let's go through the, let's go through our code base. And do we have any classes that uh, are never inherited from, yet they, uh, they have a virtual destructor or another virtual function? And it turned out that, uh, that there were a few and removing virtual, uh, all the virtuals from, uh, from those, again, we talk about classes that are uh, never inherited from, uh, it uh, helped to shave off a couple of kilobytes right away from, uh, from the binary size. So a single virtual destructor it does have a big price, but then if, uh, if you already have one, uh, well, it doesn't matter that much. You don't really have to worry if, uh, if you have to add uh, some more uh, virtual functions, you, you don't have to invest a lot of time. Like, okay, how should I, how could I avoid this? And uh, yes, even if your class is not really optimal for optimization, we saw that change when I moved from uh, the initial value from, uh, from zero to, to one, even then, even then this, is, uh, this, is, this can be a significant difference, this uh, extra virtual. So, that's, I say, definitely something to look into, if uh, if uh, if you want to to shave off a few kilobytes here and there. Now this is a bigger one. Binary size is an RTTI. This is something when you can gain quite some. But first, okay, what is RTTI? What does it stand for? It stands for runtime type information. Basically, uh, you can query the, the type names and type information of, uh, of polymorphic classes uh, at, uh, at runtime. And uh, then you can determine the dynamic type of, uh, of an object with the help of uh, RTTI. And by default, it's turned on your compiler. You can turn it off with uh, dash f no RTTI on GCC client and uh, with this uh, slash gr minus on MSVC. And it's probably something uh, that's uh, worth looking into. So RTTI gives us two, well, three, three things. First, it gives us type ID and uh, and uh, std type info, it uh, type ID returns std type info. And uh, you might use it to, to compare the types of, uh, of two objects. Well, I, my experience, it's often queried to get the name of a type and then, uh, then maybe it's uh, printed for logs, uh, usually during, uh, only during uh, development, normally you, you remove that. Uh, from uh, from the code, but well, you have to keep in mind that uh, the name that it prints is uh, implementation defined. But uh, I say this is something really easy to to get rid of, and uh, I don't really see a lot of reasons to use it in uh, in production code or even otherwise. But also there is dynamic cast. And if you check what the CPP reference tells about it, 
is that, well, with dynamic cast along the inheritance tree, you can safely convert pointers and references up, down, and sideways. Well, that sounds good, right? Well, if we check how it's used, we often see it along with loads of ifs. So you might see, uh, well, I, in a, in, a, in a previous project, a couple of, uh, maybe two years ago, I, uh, I saw a similar code. It was not with off-roaders and vans, but, uh, but uh, basically it was, uh, it was similar that we tried to cast the pointer to, to one thing. We checked if it uh, worked. If not, then we move forward and uh, forward and forward. And uh, it simply looked horrible. And uh, I know that there are some people who think that, uh, who, who, who doesn't really consider this uh, as a smell or doesn't consider dynamic cast as, uh, as a code smell directly. But, uh, but uh, many and hopefully more and more people do. And if you check the core guidelines, it definitely uh, advocates against the, the broad usage of, uh, of dynamic cast. So without RTTI, Without the dynamic cast, we can have a cleaner solution. And now I'm not going to to share like implementation deal it, implementation here. It's not uh, the point. But if we can use some unified interface and uh, we let the, the runtime dispatch to to the right uh, uh, class to the right function, it will be better. Your code will be nicer. It will be more clearer. Often. Even in lines of code written, it will be a game, but uh, it will definitely uh, lead us to a smaller binary. Now, I just wrote a very smallish example with uh, these different uh, different types of cars and dynamic casts, and I compiled with dynamic cast. Then I compiled without dynamic cast, but I kept RTTI on. And then I turned RTTI off. And you see that, well, from 37.3k, we moved to 37. You might say that, well, that's uh, not a big gain. And uh, well, indeed, it's not uh, huge, but still. Uh, even here, that's like uh, it's like one percent, and uh, I tell you that if you move to a bigger scale here, that one percent uh, will uh, will 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 last. It can give you quite some uh, uh, quite some uh, <clears throat> some uh, improvement in terms of uh, binary size. Plus, well. It will help you making your uh, making your uh, code clearer. So, as as I said, the frequent usage of dynamic cast is, is really not a nice thing, and uh, still we see it too often. And uh, the simplest, probably the simplest thing you can do is that you ban it from your code base because you don't really gain anything from it. In most cases, <clears throat> I had a discussion with. Uh, with, uh, with a friend of mine recently who, who shared the use case where they use dynamic cast so they wouldn't be able to turn it off. So I'm not saying that you should turn it off in all cases. No, I'm saying that uh, in most cases, uh, dynamic cast is not really needed and you can, uh, you can end up with a much nicer code a better, even a better uh, architecture if you don't uh, rely on it. And even your binary will be smaller. So I know that in one of the projects uh, I've been working on, there was a big initiative to remove every dynamic cast and, and just make the, the binary smaller, and that uh, really helped. Now let's talk a little bit about exceptions. Uh, this is quite an old... Uh, image, so it might not be 
completely appropriate in terms of uh, all these uh, all these uh, values, but we can uh, see like uh, different kinds of operations, like uh, how how many CPU cycles usually they uh, they take, and uh, you see somewhere in the bottom C C plus plus exceptions thrown and coped, and uh, well. Compared to all the rest, it 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 has uh, quite some uh, quite some cost. It has its runtime cost, but are we talking about runtime today? Not really. We are talking about uh, binary sizes, and uh, at many places, you can read that. Well, you don't really have to worry about the exceptions because uh, if they are not thrown, they have zero cost. But that's not entirely true. They have a zero runtime cost. But uh, think about it. Like uh, if you use exceptions, you simply write uh, a bit more code. I'm not saying if it's good or bad. It's a it's a fact. You you have to write there a bit uh, more code, and uh, because of that, the compilation time well it must be slower. So it's not uh, zero cost, and. Uh, the generated exception tables, the unwind information, well, they have to be stored somewhere. They have to be stored in the binary. So what if we turn exceptions off? Because we can do that with uh, dash F no exceptions. Then, well, exceptions cannot be thrown. At least you cannot use... Uh, try, catch, and, uh, and throw keywords in your code because otherwise it just uh, it doesn't compile. Well, if exceptions are still thrown, maybe from a standard library or from a third party library, then still terminate will be called immediately. Your, uh, your application will, uh, will abort. Uh, but does this affect a simple class? If we turn uh, of exceptions, and uh, you know, I just used uh, that very uh, the, the simple note class here uh, with a different uh, uh, with a with a different uh, size of arrays to have a big uh, binary. But it turned out that uh, it didn't affect the binary at all. Well. Why, why is that? Uh, if you remember, I uh, mentioned earlier that uh, using uh, using the default at the first declaration time, uh, it helps the compiler to perform uh, certain optimizations. And uh, in this case, where I use default special functions, well, uh, one of those uh, one of those optimizations is that uh, well the compiler will try to make uh, every special function uh, no except even if you don't uh, explicitly say that your uh, move operations the copy constructor the, the the copy assignment operator should be no except the compiler will try to make them no except and uh, then, we are already in a situation that, uh, well, they they shouldn't really have uh, any unwind ex information or exception tables. So therefore, uh, we didn't gain anything here. Well, I realized it uh, after I uh, had these numbers. So let's move on. Let's try to find a more complex case. And uh, I uh, took an implementation of the observer pattern from uh, Klaus's uh, book on uh, modern C++ software design. And uh, I compiled it with without exceptions. And uh, turned out that uh, without exceptions, well, we could gain uh, a few hundred bytes, even, uh, even on this uh, small, uh, small binary. And uh, well, it's the difference is not big, but if you have a look at uh, the, the generated instructions, you will see in the text segment some uh, exception table, some exception tables. Uh, but well, I don't uh, include everything here. 
and uh, yeah, that's something we can we can get rid of if we turn uh, exceptions off. All flow this kind of uh, code about uh, exceptions. But what if you do need some uh, some exceptions, and you cannot turn exceptions completely off? Well, then you can use no except. And uh, with that, you can specif specify whether a function uh, can uh, or cannot, should or should not throw an exception. Uh, you can uh, communicate that, well, these are not going to throw exceptions uh, if you use no except or if you use its conditional version. Uh, well, otherwise, if something is still thrown, as mentioned before, to terminate will be called. So I uh, played a bit more and uh, I added no except everywhere. Now I'm not saying you should do this because you should really think about what can be no except. Uh, if you are uh, checking some uh, proposals to the standard, you will see how uh, serious discussions go on, whether something uh, in the standard library should or should not be no except. And actually, there are, there are not so many. Uh, there are not so many library functions uh, out there that uh, are even conditionally no except. But for the sake of example, well, I uh, put no except everywhere. And uh, as you can see, I ended up with a bigger binary. I was like, "What? That's impossible." Well. There were exception tables everywhere. When I compared like all the functions, no except. And uh, it turns out that, well, I, 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 first I was thinking that, uh, well, I'm, I'm missing something here and there, but uh, it turned out that there is a bug on, uh, on the compiler that uh, I use. And uh, there was uh, already discussion uh, about it on llvm.org. But the goal point is that uh, when you think that uh, you're going to, to decrease the binary size, you should measure first. And don't just think that uh, it will be fine because uh, you, you, you never know. Compilers are really complex. Uh, they're, I think in general, they don't have a lot of bugs, but they might have bugs. And it also might have that... Uh, you, you you misunderstand something about uh, about their logic or uh, how uh, how these uh, uh, these bloats can be can be shaped. Also, measure. For example, in our pipeline, we always uh, compare to to the previous uh, previous uh, delivered binary size, so we we know right away at the end of uh, and of a CI view that, uh, well, this had a positive, this had a negative effect. Well, sometimes you just accept, uh, but sometimes you say, hmm, I think I shouldn't do. I will share an example like that uh, a bit later. Let's move on to the last but one topic. So I took the observer pattern, as I mentioned, from Klaus's book, and uh, I looked into binary sizes a little bit. Uh, oh, here I write the decorator. Sorry for that. It's really the observer that uh, first I wanted to talk about both the decorator and the observer, but the observer uh, seemed to be more uh, interesting, which is a behavior a design pattern. And basically, so uh, you can have uh, some observed objects uh, named subject here. And uh, they can notify their observers about uh, changes in their state. That's, that's what uh, it's about. Uh, Klaus's book explains it uh, very well and very deeply and provides uh, different implementations. I took two, a classical and uh, a modern one. So uh, obviously the code doesn't fit all well here. But uh, I took uh, the most important part uh, parts of the code. So you see that uh, we have a base class, an observer. And uh, 
And uh, we implement an address observer in which we override the update function where we do manage the state changes when uh, the observed objects uh, when the observed object notifies its observers, that's where we go in the update. And uh, you see that, for example, in this case, we have uh, this person, we attach uh, this address observer right here. That's, that's how it uh, looks like it depends. You, you see it uh, uses a bit of templates, definitely uses uh, uh, inheritance. So we have uh, virtual functions here and dynamic dispatching. And we have the modern version, which is a bit similar, but still it, it significantly differs because here you just have this uh, uh, observer template. Uh, in this case, it uh, took uh, this person and uh, the state change. And uh, if you want to attach to the person an observer, well, uh, you instantiate this person observer and uh, its constructor takes uh, something that uh, we conveniently call on update, but on update can be, can be implemented in different ways. In this case, it's a std function that uh, returns nothing, but uh, it takes a uh, subject and, and the state tag. Well, this is important here that uh, we are taking a std function. <clears throat> we pass it to, to the observer, the constructor, and then off we go, we use it. Now let's see the binary size. So you might expect that uh, at least because of uh, the classical version dealing with uh, with V tables and dynamic dispatching, it should be the bigger one because both the classical and the modern observer uh, they they do use templates, and still the modern observer is compiled to a bigger binary. So I was like, hmm. I, I spent quite some time trying to, to understand it, but uh, I, I couldn't really find uh, the reason until I realized that uh, the way we pass uh, that uh, function to, to the observer's uh, constructor, that matters a lot because uh, if we use std function, which seemed quite convenient, then we have this uh, ten percent different, uh, where uh, the modern is is uh, the bigger one by by about ten percent. But if we use function pointers, or uh, we use a mixture of function pointers and lambda functions, you see that then we have the let's say the expected result, and the modern observer becomes the smaller one. And uh, the, the, my point here is that, uh, well, details matter because uh, you might say that, well, I want to choose the right design approach and it is very important to choose the uh, right uh, design patterns. And uh, if you can, you can go with, uh, with a more compile time, with a, uh, with a more modern version, uh, but implementation details they also matter a lot when you compare these solutions because even with the uh, so-called uh, better modern pattern, we ended up with a bigger binary because uh, because uh, I didn't choose the right uh, implementation details. And it turns out that how you pass functions, that matters a lot. And uh, since... Uh, since then, I had lots of discussions on uh, on this at uh, at work, and uh, I have a colleague who simply wants to ban std function from our code base unless we really, really need it because it's so bloated. So if you have to pass functions around, you have different options. You have plenty of options, I would say. You can use std function. So in this case, we have this foo which takes a function that returns a boolean, 
that takes a string as a parameter. And uh, well, we call it a quite convenient way. That's not our only option. You could use bare templates as well. Uh, we use this callable and uh, well, we, we call it the same way. Now you martyr, you might argue, but this is uh, something completely inferior because with stood uh, function, well, we, we restricted uh, what kind of function it can take. And here you will have very ugly, you might end up with uh, unexpected results or, uh, or uh, very ugly uh, compilation errors and you are right. But for example, if you have access to CPP uh, 20 and you have access to concepts, then you have a really neat way to, to emulate uh, the most, probably the most important parts of, uh, of those. So you can say that, uh, well, that callable should always return uh, a Boolean and uh, it should uh, take, take a string. But even, uh, even uh, with uh, earlier versions and with SVA, you could uh, emulate it, but uh, that wouldn't be readable for sure. But uh, in this case, we have something uh, quite readable and uh, we can restrict what we accept and what we don't accept. Now, you can also accept function pointers. Uh, person, I hate this, uh, this syntax, but uh, if you use some, uh, if you use an alias, you can obviously you can make it a bit, uh, bit better, a bit more readable, and uh, then you you can have uh, some similar uh, behavior. Well, you have different options, you have different advantages, and we are not going into all the well, we are not going into the uh, uh, the the some, some features of uh, of stud function, but uh, in most cases, you don't uh, really need that. And it's true that uh, function pointers, they have an obscure syntax, while std function, well, it, 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 it works well with like everything, with any kind of lambda function, for example, even if, uh, well, there you have it, even if uh, you need uh, a lambda with, uh, with an with an initializer, std function can can deal with it. But uh, you, we also have uh, templates which are quite uh, specializable. Uh, you can specialize them quite well. You can uh, can constrain them quite well. So let's run some experiment. Here I use the function pointer, but only in this example because that was the shortest one. Uh, and I could fit on one uh, page. I have uh, four different lambdas here and uh, I just pass it with some uh, parameters to perform operation. <coughs> Let's see the results. So you see that std function was, uh, the, uh, well, it resulted uh, in a significantly bigger binary. Whereas uh, templates and function pointers, uh, they uh, were about the same size. And uh, just these days, we are running some bigger experiments on our code base, like removing a std function. And uh, tell you, it's, it's quite promising. It's, uh, it doesn't only work on the small scale, it works on bigger scale as, uh, as well, if you can consider getting uh, getting rid of them because they are quite bloaty. Uh, so I would go with templates or, uh, or function pointers whenever I can, because in fact, they are also, also faster, but uh, in terms of size, they are cheaper. Probably they are not more readable than std function, probably. I'm not entirely convinced on that, but uh, even if you consider suit function more readable, it has a big price. So one last uh, tote on, uh, on templates, well, maybe two totes here. Uh, one is that uh, you should make sure you understand when you use templates. I heard it 
by uh, Vario C++ Trainer, I think. Maybe it was uh, maybe it was Carlos, but I'm not sure. Maybe it was someone else. That often they ask the question, like in beginner trainings, that uh, okay, guys, do you use templates? And many say that ah, oh, we don't use them. But uh, it's almost sure that uh, in reality we we use that at least through the the standard library, uh, which is full of uh, full of templates. But uh, a little bit modern C plus plus. Uh, if you use auto, it might uh, deceive. It might deceive uh, uh, some people if uh, if they are not so experienced with it. You see that, uh, for example, we have these autos everywhere. Auto add A B. Well, even without the template keyword, we can have templates now. So this this is a template, uh, and if we use templates, we should use minimal ones because uh how does it how does it look like so uh a template is like a blueprint and uh each time you you each each time a template uh is expanded it means that copy uh, code is copied over all over the place well there are some uh, compiler optimizations that uh, might uh, find the same uh, uh, the same code uh, from from different templates and keeps uh, only one, but uh, in general you shouldn't rely on it. And uh, it means that the longer your uh, blueprint is, the longer the template is, the more the longer pieces of code will be copied over and over again. And uh, if you can, you should keep your templates small and uh, extract whatever that doesn't have to be in the template. So for example, if you have this, you have this uh, template uh, function foo, and uh, well, let's say we only use t uh, in the beginning. Then you have a long piece of code that doesn't really rely on T directly because we are just using the result of uh, of this call. And then you shouldn't have a template like that. Uh, you should you should extract the rest and uh, just call that function your template. With that, you can also gain some uh, some significant uh, space. Uh, I uh, I don't have exact uh, numbers on this. Obviously, it will really depend on uh, on uh, the length of these functions and also uh, also the number of different uh, template expansions. So, what what are the main pieces of advice after uh, after this hour? So, if size really matters for you, we try to prevent. Uh, Lining for the special fun special functions, and you might want to go against the, the the best practices and want to use the default in the header. Well, if you use exceptions, think about them twice because uh, they 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 are not zero codes. They do have a big cost on uh, on uh, on your binary. If you need them, well, uh, make sure that you use no except wherever you can meaningfully do it. And, uh, oh, there is something uh, uh, important here with uh, with regards of default, defaulted functions and no except. If you default a uh, function in the header, it will be implicitly a no except if it can be no except. The compiler will decide on that. But if uh, you don't default that first declaration, you only default uh, in, in the CPP file, then uh, the compiler will not try to make your special functions no except. You have to do it explicitly on, uh, on your own. And uh, that was a big realization a few, a few weeks ago when we didn't understand why with uh, certain changes or uh, or uh, binary didn't uh, decrease and then we understood that oh okay so it's uh, it's written somewhere that uh, 
that uh, this is the behavior, just what I uh, explained to you right now. And then we started to explicitly add the no except to these uh, defaulted uh, functions. And, uh, and uh, there we had it. There we had the decrease that we were looking for. Uh, and definitely don't use virtuals in vain because uh, they, uh, the first virtual in a, in a class always has, uh, has a big price. So try to try, uh, try to get rid of it. And if you can, turn RTTI off. With that, you can, uh, you can gain uh, a lot in a real life uh, scale, probably much more than uh, what you saw with, uh, with my numbers. And those who, when you pass functions around, try not to think about std function, but choose something else if, uh, if you can. So what should you do with all these? Because I have uh, shared many, many different things. Some are applicable, some are not applicable in, uh, in all cases. Some are best practices, some are not. But at least you should be aware uh, of these different techniques and, and effects. And uh, keep in mind that uh, what you heard here is, well, not always best practices, but uh, it's uh, realizations I made on a quest for uh, optimizing for space because you can optimize for different things. Compile time, for runtime, for memory footprint, or for uh, binary uh, size, for example. And uh, avoid some, some traps that, uh, that I uh, just uh, mentioned, like, uh, forgetting about uh, no accepting stuff, or uh, you should always uh, compare, like uh, what you change, was it really useful or not? Because you might uh, find out that uh, things are not always working the same way as you expect. And then uh, share the knowledge uh, uh, in your teams to, to your colleagues, because uh, this, uh, this is the most important thing that, uh, that we help each other grow. That's that's why I was uh, that's why I was here. Thanks a lot for listening. I'll be there for uh, for the discussion, and I'm really interested in like how you make your uh, executables uh, smaller. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you, Chanel, for this wonderful talk. Um, there are many questions in the chat. Do you want to um, address them now? I. The thing is, something might be wrong with my Twitch then because I saw no questions. Well, then something <laughs> went wrong, but uh, that's yeah. uh, no worries. We can go to the, through them now if you want. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks. Um, it's not. It's not too many of them. Let's just uh, start at the top. Uh, let me just quickly find them. So here, there's one. Um, um, CPPL asks, does this mean you should default to CVP even when explicitly defaulting is not actually required? Um, okay, I'm not sure if I understand it uh, correctly, but uh, I would say that uh, if you can go with the rule of zero, if uh, you can go with like a not, uh, not uh, explicitly uh, defining any of your special functions, then you shouldn't do it. But uh, if you have to, if you have to define them, then try to use default. Use default whenever you can. And uh, if you want uh, the gain on the binary size, then do it in the in the implementation file. But if you do that, don't uh, forget what I uh, said about no except. Then you have to make them no except uh, explicitly. It won't be automatically uh, implemented as no except by the compiler for you. I hope I yeah. answered the question. I think so. Um, uh, oh, I hope so. <laughs> I don't know if the person understood. Um, there's another question that kind of ties into this by uh, Pablo. Um, I'm not sure how to pronounce that entirely, but we just put it on the screen. Um, mm, yeah, that's a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a very good question. So 
Regarding defaulting in header versus CPP files doesn't this apply to all functions in general and not just to special mender functions? Uh, that's something I was uh, wondering too, just uh, in, in fact, just uh, yesterday. Because, uh, well, there are two things to it. Like, uh, now you ask this very good question. Uh, it, after, well, for some time, I didn't have this question because it's one thing that you do things that are against some best practices, but uh, you, you you don't want to turn uh, your code base into a horrible mess either. And uh, you don't uh, want to, to get rid of uh, the, the implementation files completely. Plus, there is the other thing like... Uh, uh, now I'm, you know, I'm thinking about what I observe. So, sorry, I'm uh, moving from here and there. So, one thing, I uh, did something uh, similar yesterday with one function because I thought that it shouldn't really be. Uh, for example, in, in, in the header, I moved it to, to the CPP and uh, it increased the binary size by, by 12K. I moved it okay. from the header to the CPP and it increased the binary size by 12K only, <laughs> only on one target, only when we built for, uh, for Mac OS, for... Uh, the other targets, it didn't change anything. So this is something I actually also want to go a bit, uh, bit deeper and uh, to understand it better because I yeah, saw some explicitly inline uh, functions, uh, some that were just there because people, I don't think they wanted to create uh, the, the CPP file for, uh, for one function. You know, sometimes we, we are just lazy. Uh, and in these two cases, the binary grew when I uh, moved them to the CPP. Maybe that's something we can, uh, we can discuss after on the Zoom. I'm interested in your uh, insights. But at the same time, whenever we moved, the default from uh, the header to the CPP, we could observe the game. So something is different. I think there's two effects at play. There's one is inlining, and the other one is uh, like this building. But let's let's talk about this in the after chat. I have some some mm -hmm. thoughts that could be uh, I'd be interested. Relevant. Yeah. Um, let's let's go on. There's a. Um, a bit of a discussion around standard function and uh, no except, but it's not really questions. It's more like chat mm -hmm. talking to itself. And uh, <laughs> some of it was also already answered. And uh, yeah, these are not black and white things. Yeah, absolutely. Like uh, someone even said, like, is there anything in C++ that's not uh, uncontroversial? Like, um, so let's see. Uh, so Andreas asks, uh, what is your take on using external template to reduce binary size impact from templates? Uh, I cannot answer that question. That's something I haven't looked into. But I take uh, take a note, and actually, that's an excellent topic for uh, for my uh, my blog. <laughs> so uh, we are looking forward to reading about it. Yeah, I hope. 